Again, we have no idea what taxes will be like in the future, if they're going to go up or go down, but I think it's really important from a family standpoint to have yourself in a position where you are tax diversified. Welcome to the Your Life, Your Money podcast with Scott Searins, teaching you how to thrive in life, wealth, and retirement. Thanks for listening to Your Life, Your Money. I'm Ben George. He's Scott Searins, President and Financial Advisor at Searins Financial Group. You'll find us online at lifemoneyshow.com. Scott, what's going on? Ben, another great day. Now, I've got a question for you here today, Ben. I was okay. having an, an interesting conversation with a friend. And we were talking about age. And if you could pick an age in your life so far that you could just be stuck at, what age would you pick? Um, man, I think, I mean, I, I'm pretty happy with where I am. I think that's, uh, there's definitely ages you go back to and you say that'd be a lot of fun to be. Um, but I, I really like where I am right now with a little daughter that's been a ton of fun to, to spend time with every day. And get to see her grow. Um, but I guess if I had to pick an age just in terms of like energy and, and health and all that and, and, and say everything else, like my life continues to uh, evolve the same way, uh, I'd probably go like, I don't know, 28, 29, maybe. I feel like I was in pretty good shape, you know, pretty, pretty good health, all that stuff. Yeah. All right. See, and I, so I'm 39 and I would actually say I'm good if I can maintain this age, right? And, yeah. you know, and <laughs> still go out and, and, and meet somebody and, and, and get married, have kids. But if I could still maintain current age, I'm, right. I'm good. Maybe it's just because I'm like that year before age 40. Although I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I don't know about you. I'm not much of a, like the birthday thing doesn't bother me. Okay. I know that gets on a lot of people's minds, but for me, it's just, you know, I, I kind of look at it like, hey, it's another year. But yeah, same. I feel like, you know, I've got good energy and health and if I could just maintain this age, I'd be good. That'd be, it'd, it'd be really nice. Yeah, it's an interesting. It's an interesting question to ask. I'm sure everybody kind of has different answers. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you in terms of like age. We just kind of had these. We get these kind of preconceived notions created early in our lives of of what a number is and w- what that means. But you know, 40, and I just turned 40, Scott. So I'm I'm on the other side of the of the hill, I guess, as we speak. But I, I think of 40 when I was younger, and and it just seems so old. But now. I mean, I don't feel much different than I felt, you know, 10, even 15 years ago. Yeah. Just, like you said, just, just a number, right? And and I, I probably had some of those pre, same preconceived notions, you know, looking at that age, at, you know, in my 20s. But there's also things of, you know, just kind of um, say where I'm at from a professional standpoint, what I've just learned in life. And I'm, you know, maybe I'll look back when I'm 50 and go, hey, this is a great age. Um, but yeah, I just, I feel like, boy, I've learned a ton and um, I'm happy with it. It's, that, it, was, it was just an interesting conversation, so I thought I'd bring it up to you too. Yeah, it's a great kind of starter conversation for us today, and I, I appreciate that. Let's, let's talk about what we want to discuss on the show today, which is the financial mistakes that couples often make. And I would imagine it's got to be difficult to get spouses on the same page with their retirement plan because... I mean, we, we, we've heard it all the time, right? One of the, the biggest disagreements in a relationship is about money. You are correct. And actually, that's, uh, I mean, I'm going to dive in right off of what you said there. That is, that's the number one thing, right? And, and when you talk about mistakes that couples make when it comes to their finances is number one mistake in my eyes is just not having financial conversations. I don't hold me to any of these st- statistics, right? But it's like one of the major causes for divorce. I see, you know, that it can be a, a cause of a lot of fights in, in couples' relationships. And so I guess I just really challenge anyone listening is to, you know, if you are a couple is to just sit down and, and talk about your finances. It could be a weekly check-in. It could be a monthly check-in. And, you know, maybe just put some, I'll call it parameters in in regards to your overall picture. And there's probably going to be some compromise in, in these parameters, right? Um, but having those conversations about expenses, do you understand your cash flow? Do you understand how much is coming in? Do you understand how much is going out? Do you understand, you know, who's saving what to their 401k or to their Roth? Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but do you really understand what your cash flow 
looks like. Maybe you want to put into place some sort of spending rules. Hey, if you're going to you know, spend over, and I'm just making up numbers, $500, or if you're going to spend over $1,000 that you really want to, you know, maybe talk to your spouse in regards to that and just say, hey, you know, this is something that's important to me. You okay with it? Yep. Good, good. And and that way you go uh, go about it and, and make those purchases. But I think it's when when all of that stuff happens without the discussion, that's where the, the controversy can can come into place. And then the last is, you know, are you on the same page of what you are saving for and what you're saving towards? Meaning, when do you want to achieve financial independence? Do you need a new car at some point in time? Are you are you both working towards that together? Maybe it's vacations are important to you or you want to take, you know, a certain vacation each and every year. Maybe it's on your mind to have a second home in the future. Whatever those things are, just are you having the conversations about it? Are you on the same page in regards to it? And are you working together towards it versus, I'll call it, having it work you apart? Yeah, communication. It's the key of in any any relationship, and it's no different than when you're dealing with your finances. you got to have those conversations. All right, let's talk about some of the sp- uh, mistakes more specifically beyond that, Scott. And uh, first up, let's talk pensions. Um, yeah, hopefully, if you are fortunate enough to have a pension, that is a great spot to be in. And for those that do, um, they often, you know, one of the problems is they're making the wrong choice on how they're handling that spousal benefit option. Yeah, it's a pension planning is a big part of our process with our clients. And it's really understanding what they call is the survivor benefit. And what does that mean? Well, the survivor benefit is... Um, Let's just say, we're just to kind of use an example here, if, if Ben were to have a pension uh, or to be offered a pension, and let's just say Ben's pension was $5,000 a month. Well, if you did not take any sort of survivor benefits on that pension, Ben, then your spouse, if you were to pass away, your spouse would be left with nothing. Right, and, I'm, and I, I guess when I'm talking pensions here, I'm, I'm talking about you know how company pensions typically work. And I find, unfortunately, that this happens a lot, which then leaves the remaining spouse, you know, I'll say, leaves the remaining spouse very concerned at a time where, you know, they need protection the most, right? (laughs) And where they don't need to worry because somebody, their spouse just passed away. Not only are they, you know, focused on that from an emotional standpoint, now they've got this worry that this pension has gone away or has been reduced. And I find a lot of times is that people just look at their statement, they see the top number, it's usually the highest number of how much they'll get, and they just take that. And a lot of times that top, that best number, that highest number that you're going to get from your pension, it comes without any sort of spousal benefit. Again, you pass away, your spouse isn't going to receive any further benefits from that pension. So it's really important to understand that and understand how that fits into your plan and all of the other options that are offered to you. So sometimes pensions, you could have different types of survivor benefits, meaning a 50% survivor benefit, a 75% survivor benefit, or 100%, meaning 100% would be like, same example there, right? If that pension now, usually if you're taking one of these different benefits, they might reduce that amount, right? So Ben, if I, instead of that $5,000 amount, let's just say for a 100% survivor benefit, you may only get $4,000 a month, but now if you were to pass away, that $4,000 a month is going to continue on for your spouse for the rest of her life. And so that's really important to understand. Now, sometimes too, companies also offer what's called a, a lump sum option. And you might be thinking, wait a second, why would I want to take this lump sum option when this company is giving me like this guaranteed stream of income? And here's the deal. If you leave the pension at the company, you pass away, your spouse passes away, who keeps the rest of the money? The company does, right? Mm -hmm. But you take that lump sum and there's a lot of companies out there that will recreate, and I'm putting in quotes here, a pension for you, basically lifetime income stream for you, where now the ownership of those funds are actually in your name. So now you pass away, your spouse passes away. If there's anything left in that fund, that would go to your beneficiaries, to your children, whomever you've listed as as the beneficiaries. So it's really important to do 
all of the calculations around pensions. Sometimes it's best to leave it with the company because of the payout rate that they're giving you. Sometimes it might be best to take it and put it into your name, the lump sum option and own it because maybe those payouts rates would be better. Or for some people that want to pass on a legacy, they, I've seen where some people will take a little bit smaller of a payout rate, but now they've got ownership of that money. So that way that money is staying with them and in their family and with their beneficiaries. So pension planning is a, a really big part of understanding your future income, understanding how a spouse would live, continue to maintain lifestyle if one spouse were to pass away, and how to make all of your overall funds last. All right, let's stick with the retirement income conversation. Let's move to Social Security. The area, I guess, here for, for couples that really they're making mistakes in is is not working together when they're coming up with their claiming strategy. And some people might say, oh, wait, you need a claiming strategy? But you know, this there's a lot of thought and conversation that goes into when to take Social Security, and you should be coordinating that with your spouse. Absolutely, Ben. And, and it's actually a pretty similar conversation to pension planning. And here's why. When it comes to Social Security, if one spouse were to pass away, you only keep one of the two Social Securities and you're going to keep the higher of the two. So when working with a lot of clients, what we'll do, we're not only looking at, you know, a lot of times people just look at Social Security and they say, hey, what's the payback period, right? They say, okay, if I were to pass away at age 75 or age 85 or age 90, what age do I take it to get the most back out of Social Security? And that's one way to look at it. But I think you add, need to add into to it a couple other factors. The other factors are making sure that your spouse is okay if you're to pass away. And then the third factor is how much do you have saved up in your retirement savings? Because I find that sometimes people can take Social Security too early, then that puts a lot of pressure on making their retirement savings last, where they could be taking too much out, could run out of money, right? Or maybe they've saved a ton up in their retirement savings, and that gives them then a lot of different options. It gives them the option to wait on Social Security as long as possible, let it grow as much as, at least one of them grow as much as possible. So that way, again, one person were to pass away, one of the Social Securities is as high as it's going to be. But it also gives them kind of another option, right? They've got a ton in their retirement savings. They don't have to worry about running out of money. Maybe then they take, it a little, take Social Security a little bit earlier and they use that to either live their lifestyle or some people have, you know, go through the process of actually thinking about reinvesting that money. So you really want to think about not just how long are you going to live, but you want to coordinate it with your retirement date, other sources of income that you have coming in, and then also look at it from a standpoint of if one person were to pass away, you want to make sure that the remaining spouse is protected to also help maintain their lifestyle as well. All right. Makes a lot of sense. Um, this next one kind of goes back to our original point uh, that you made, at least, Scott, on you need to be having conversations about your finances. Uh, much along the same lines, you know, couples don't always talk about what they want their retirement to look like, which some people might think is crazy because you think you might, you should be discussing, hey, how do we want to spend our time? What do we want to do? Are we traveling? Are we going to spend time with kids? Like, this seems like a conversation you would know to have, but not everybody's doing that. You're totally correct, Ben. Isn't it amazing how we can just get like so involved in our day-to-day -day life or just this year of what's going on that, yeah, a lot of people, you know, they're not really thinking about the future or thinking about what they want to do in retirement or they really like to work. Um, I'll share a quick story with you here. I have a, a couple where, you know, one person enjoys their job, but it's not you know, something that they really want to continue to do each and every year. And, you know, they have a lot of hobbies that they would enjoy doing versus going to work where the other spouse, you know, is enjoys working, enjoys what they do, enjoys going and having those, you know, those discussions each and every day with their, their coworkers. And so they've achieved financial independence. And I think a big thing for them right now is that discussion of, well, wait a second, you know, if we're to retire, what is that going to look like? What are we going to, what are we going to do? I think I shared on a, a previous episode, and I'll bring it back up here. I think it's a, a really good idea is if you're getting kind of close to that timeline of retirement is maybe 
taking a two week break and treating that two week break like retirement, right? What would you, if you, if you were retired for that two week break or vacation from work, do in retirement and, and try to like, you know, manage your days like that. It might help you kind of um, figure that out. But I do see it a lot of times where people have gotten into this repetition of work or they like work and one couple, that's what they're focused on or one spouse is focused on that, but the other spouse might have some different ideas. And when they're coming to sit down with me and sit at the table, it's kind of the first time that they're talking about it and opening up about it. And so I'd really challenge people to, you know, start opening up about it now, having those conversations now, what's important, you know, to each other of, of what they want you know, retirement and, and financial independence to look like and how do they envision themselves kind of molding what's important to each other. All right. Uh, let's get back to more specific financial stuff uh, where, where couples are making mistakes. And we, we talked about coordinating social security strategy. What about coordinating individual accounts like 401ks and IRAs? Because I think about yeah, even my, my wife and I, I mean, we, we had our own retirement accounts already set up. We were already contributing on our own before, you know, even before we met, I've never really thought about, hey, let's actually go through these and make sure our assets are aligned and working together. Yeah. And I, I think this, we're going to, you know, tackle this in a couple different points here. But the first point that I just want to talk, and it's specific to like what you said here, is coordinating our accounts is a, from a tax diversification standpoint. So you okay. might be putting all of your money into a traditional 401k. Your spouse might be be putting all of their money into a traditional 401k. So now we have got all of our money going into the same tax bucket where we're getting, yes, you might be getting a tax deduction today, but you will have to pay tax on all of that money in the future. To share a quick story with you, just a, a recent um, projection that we did for a couple, same thing. They put all of their money into their traditional 401k bucket. And based on some projections, their taxable income could be actually the same or more in their future. In their retirement years, those years where everybody thinks that taxes go down, their taxes could actually be the same or more in those years because of the forced required minimum distributions. So it's important to really think up front and start diversifying yourself from a family standpoint, not only on the tax standpoint, but also Maybe there's, you know, the traditional 401k type money. Typically, you can't touch that or withdraw from those buckets until age 59 and a half. So if there are things that you want to do before age 59 and a half, maybe it's important then that you start utilizing a brokerage account to save and invest. Maybe you want to retire early, retire before age 59 and a half. Well, then do you have money in a different tax bucket, a bucket that's not going to get penalized for taking it out before that age? that you can withdraw from to continue to maintain your lifestyle. And then that last bucket to think about is that Roth IRA, that Roth 401k bucket of putting money into that bucket as well. Again, we have no idea what taxes will be like in the future, if they're going to go up or go down, but I think it's really important from a family standpoint to have yourself in a position where you are tax diversified. Okay. That makes a lot of sense when you think about it from a tax perspective. When I think about money and I think about arguing about money, I think about how comfortable each spouse is with risk. I would, I would assume, you know, one of the conversations you have, Scott, with clients is that, you know, how comfortable are you taking on risk? And one might say, I'm fine. We can be aggressive. And the other might say, I don't, I'm afraid to lose any money. I would imagine this is a, a point of contention for, for a lot of couples. Yeah, you know, it's it's always interesting because I'll always ask our our clients and prospective clients individually, you know, on a scale system where they kind of sit in comparison to the market that everybody knows, like the S and P five hundred, what we see on TV each and every day, where they sit from a risk standpoint. You're right. Sometimes they'll align. A lot of times they'll be different. And I think it's really important for couples to align on this as they move forward in creating their plan. Because the key part of a plan is that you stick to it, you know, and you want to stick to it over the long term. So while for one person, it might not be as much growth they were hoping, maybe for that more conservative person, right, they're taking on a little bit more growth than they were hoping for. 
But if there's some compromise there, the goal is, is that couple will stick to the plan. So I think that's, that's really important. I also think it's important, kind of back to what we were talking about before, aligning, you know, as a family, from a family standpoint, right? Each couple kind of aligning not only which accounts they're contributing their money to, but what kind of risk are you taking in your overall accounts? And you might have goals, right, for, for a couple of trying to achieve something. And based on that goal, it might mean that you need to be on more of a growth standpoint. But if one person is just conservative and mentally doing that in their accounts, and you haven't, you know, if you haven't aligned as a family, well, that could actually be holding you back from potentially meeting those future goals. So I think it's not only, you know, aligning your accounts from, like we talked earlier, tax diversification standpoint, making sure you're both on track from a, I'll say a risk reward standpoint to hit your goals. And then are you both okay with the risk you're taking so you'll maintain and um, stick to the plan to be able to hit those goals? I have one more on our list that I wanted to, to hit on with you, and that's the estate plan part of all this. And I think we all kind of drag our feet with estate planning because one, you know, thinking about and talking about death is nothing that, that we want to do typically. But also, you know, we, we feel like that's just a ways down the road. It doesn't affect me right now. But not having that estate plan, that transition plan in place is a big mistake for couples. Yeah. I, you know, I see this, um, unfortunately, all the time, you know, folks that are sitting down within five or 10 years of retirement and we're sitting down and having that discussion. And, and really, this applies to everybody. But um, having those discussions and going through and asking those questions, do you have a will in place? And the answer is no. Do you have a trust in place? The answer is no. Not everybody needs a trust, but and then how about your powers of attorney, medical or financial? And the answers are no. And I would say this is an area that people really need to focus on. You're right, Ben. Nobody wants to think about it, right? It's just it's one of those things like, oh my gosh, if I go down, if I go and sit down with the attorney, something's going to happen to me the day after. And I can't say it never happens, but it rarely, 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 rarely ever happens, right? And it's just making sure everything will be okay in the event something happens. Because you really have to think about this. Like, in the event something happens to you, would somebody be able to help you pay for your bills, manage your finances for you? If you're in the hospital, would somebody be able to make medical decisions for you? And a lot of times the answer is, oh man, no, uh, I'm not prepared for that. And if you think about those questions, you would probably want somebody that you trust to be able to help you with those things. So that's why it's really important to to have those parts in place. The other part that I find that um, folks really haven't had the discussions about is maybe you've saved up a, a healthy amount of money. And I find that people want to use their retirement savings, but most people say, hey, I don't want to run out, right? Like I don't want to run out in my retirement. Or for others, it's just important that they are passing on something to their, as a legacy, whether it be to beneficiaries or to their children. So I always find that there's going to be something left in the bucket at the end of the day. And so have you thought about ways to tax efficiently transfer this wealth to future generations? Maybe that's through annual gifting, right? It all depends on how much you've saved up. Maybe if you've saved up a, a significant amount, you might be looking at state estate taxes or federal estate taxes, where there's some advanced planning that needs to be done to try again to keep more money with you and your family versus giving it to the IRS through those estate taxes. So one of the ways to do that is gifting. There's also you know other strategies that can um, be put into place to keep more of that with you versus giving it to the IRS. And I think you know sometimes um, folks that have saved they, they go, Wow. Okay. Well, no, that's not me. You know, I, I, I'm not necessarily in that position. But, but you could be, right? Um, or you could be in the future if you get growth on your money. And so it's just having those conversations up front in regards to your funds. And I'm going to add one thing to here. I, I continue to stress this. It's just having the conversations with your children about the money, right? So if it's important for you to pass something on pass it on as a as a legacy or to continue to just grow in a state that will last generations and generations then have conversations with your open up with your children about your funds about your money about your savings have conversations with them about what's important to you 
not only today, but maybe what's important to you in the future, how you want it to be managed, um, what it, what you would, you know, hope or ask that it goes towards. Um, and, and there's certain trusts where you can actually set it up to manage it that you, you know, know in the future what different funds will go or be used for, whether it's, you know, educational type support um, or support to help people buy their, you know, first homes, et cetera. So I think just having all these conversations is really important in keeping you and your spouse on the right track. All about trying to keep you on the right track. That is the name of the game. So just a reminder, look, if you, if any of these things maybe kind of tipped you off to say, hey, I should probably talk to an advisor, talk to a planner, and uh, me and my spouse go in and, and talk through some of these issues that maybe uh, we didn't weren't aware of that now we are or just hadn't really thought about and we'd like to kind of get settled. The best way to do that, first off, is to visit uh, Scott's website, lifemoneyshow.com. This podcast, videos, other resources are there online with the, op- with the opportunity to uh, contact Scott there. But also you can call him directly at 847-235-6989. Because you know we, we, we want to make sure that we're having these this, these conversations, communicating effectively, and and even if you aren't, I guess, interested in finances, Scott, and a lot of spouses probably aren't, uh, it's important to, to be on the same page with what you're doing. Yeah, it's all about communication. You you said that at the beginning, and I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up with that as well. I, you know, just in meeting with a lot of different people, I would say, and I can see that they're sometimes is a difference between those that are operating as a team versus those that are operating in their individual, I'll call it silos. And those that are operating as a team, they've got goals that they're operating towards. And it just has appeared over time that, um, and, and through a lot of my different you know, meetings with folks, that that has really put them on that track um, towards a higher level of success by being just open in their communication, working together as a team when it comes to finances. And they might not know all the answers to all these questions that they that we've talked about today, but being open to go and sit down with someone to get the questions out on the table, put their answers on, on the table, and come to that compromise of, of the right ways and right directions to move forward. Very good, Scott. Well, we appreciate your insight as always here on Your Life, Your Money, and uh, please subscribe to the show. Wherever you listen, you don't want to miss a single episode. We have a new one every week. Scott, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Great conversation. Have a great day. Siren's Financial Group is an independent financial services firm that utilizes a variety of investment and insurance products. Investment advisory services offered only by duly registered individuals through AE Wealth Management, LLC. AE Wealth Management and Siren's Financial Group, Inc. are not affiliated companies. Investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any references to protection, safety, or lifetime income generally refer to fixed insurance products, never securities or investments. Insurance guarantees are backed by the financial strength and claims-paying abilities of the issuing carrier. This podcast is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be used as the sole basis for financial decisions, nor should it be construed as advice designed to meet the particular needs of an individual's situation. Siren's Financial Group, Inc. is not permitted to offer, and no statement made during this show shall constitute tax or legal advice. Our firm is not affiliated with or endorsed by the U.S. government or any governmental agency. The information and opinions contained herein, provided by third parties, have been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed by Siren's Financial Group, Inc.